In the Employee Capacity Building podcast, I talked about what BP's Chief Financial Officer, Brian Kilvari, said about his job as corporate leader through their crisis, that the hardest thing was keeping his employees positive, focused, and ensure the company's success in responding. We're going to pick back up with that theme in this podcast as we discuss the critical leadership challenges that organizations and crises face. There can be no doubt that a leader plays a pivotal role in the management and containment of a crisis. So this podcast will differentiate between crisis management and crisis leadership and explore the different kinds of roles that leaders must play all the while exploring the challenges of crisis leadership. Most business literature separates management and leadership functions along simple lines. Leadership is about relationships and relationship building. Management is functional. This figure summarizes the critical differences between management and leadership overall. However, if we think about it in a crisis-specific context, there are four critical objectives in crisis management. First, identifying how the crisis type could influence pivotal aspects of the organization like finance to ensure that as the crisis emerges, those aspects are not adversely affected. Second, helping the management team identify and assess the sources of crisis. Third, forming a strategy to end a crisis. And fourth, strategizing how to improve the organization post-crisis. However, this doesn't reflect what good leadership through crises is, because when we look back at this figure, we should be thinking about leadership as a core relational function. This is one of the reasons that great leaders also tend to be great communicators. When we begin to explore the research focusing on the more specific roles that leaders serve during crises, we see several roles that leaders have to carry out, like the psychological roles to reaffirm and inspire, functional roles to direct and manage the material needs of a crisis, getting the right people to the right places, and public relations roles. So let's take a detailed look at each one of these core crisis leadership roles. First, Leaders serve a vital psychological and emotional role for stakeholders, both inside and outside the organization. Remember that crises heighten people's sense of uncertainty and tend to raise fears and anxiety. So what's needed in these times are leaders who can make people feel like it's going to be all right. But this isn't just an internal function. A critical component in the psychological and emotional role for leaders in crises is to build trust amongst their critical stakeholders. So findings demonstrate that some of the most important features of trust in leaders during crises include someone who's going to follow through on their promises, seem transparent, give credit where it's due, and are generous with their criticisms. That is, that they don't throw people under the bus. They don't attribute blame readily to others. More than that, though, effective crisis leaders also talk about their organization's tough times. They demonstrate decisiveness, allow others to speak and participate, and simply do good work. If we take a look at this list of factors that most influence trust in a leader, it's not hard to see why effective leaders have to be good at managed relationships. All of these are about inspiring confidence, but more importantly, about being relatable. One of the outcomes of being trustworthy and reducing fear and anxiety is that good leaders are able to generate optimism during crisis. When you take a look at the language used by effective leaders in times of crisis, they tend to acknowledge the struggle, but then focus on overcoming this with a positive fight. We've seen this archetype of response for decades, from Churchill's World War II radio addresses through President Clinton's responses to the terrorist attacks in Oklahoma City, to President Obama's responses to gun violence in the U.S., and more recently into the way that leaders have responded to attacks in Belgium, Germany, France, London, Manchester. There's a defiance and a rhetoric of survival that generates optimism in the face of adversity. Good leadership is about inspiring people. We contrast this against leaders who have been less effective as crisis leaders for me. And one of the worst examples of this psychological and emotional role had to have been President Bush after 9-11. I remember listening to his first public statement. I was on my way to work and the two key messages that he sent was that the world was never more uncertain and that we would visit down retribution. 
I think he was probably trying to acknowledge the struggle and offer a rallying cry, but his rhetoric on the day and beyond focused on the messages of, we've got a lot to be afraid of, but we're going to go after them. This really offered nothing that made people feel better, a bit of what you could call Old Testament justice in the appeal, but this aspect was really lacking, and I think that shaped some of the changes in American identity for the next decade. So if the psychological and emotional role is a tricky one to maneuver because it balances out these three purposes, then we have to start thinking about the particular behaviors, and then it gets even trickier. If the psychological and emotional role is a tricky one to maneuver, it becomes complicated because not only is there a rhetorical aspect of this, but there's also a behavioral one. It's one thing to offer reassuring messages, but a leader's behavior in the midst of a crisis must also support and match their rhetoric. From a big picture stance, yes, people want to hear the warm fuzzies, but they also want to see something happen. This doesn't mean that they necessarily want a die-hard response, but from a reassurance perspective, they need to believe that the actions that the leader takes are done quickly but thoughtfully. This is one of the reasons why effective crisis planning is going to help an organization respond to a crisis effectively. It gives the leader a pre-considered set of actions that hopefully only need minor adaptations so that those first press conferences that they give or the first actions that they take aren't just punting the ball down the pitch, that they're actually meaningful moving the situation forward. All of this, though, meeting people's expectations for what leaders should deliver during crises to understanding their behaviors also requires consistent communication. Notice the first part of this, the honesty bit. People can take bad news, especially when it's delivered in a way that meets the goals we talked about, but it has to be honest. It used to be that organizations could be a bit strategically ambiguous, that they could try and shift the blame a bit, obscure the issues, and generally be a bit sleazy and people would take it. However, today's information consumers do not accept that. So if you take a look at crisis communication research in the 1990s, you'll see a lot of discussion about the strategic ambiguity tactic, but these days people's expectations have simply shifted. The other part of this is that in a 24-7 news cycle, people expect updates from the organization. This is tough though sometimes because just as a crisis is unfolding, it can be several hours before anything more is known about the situation. The problem is that the media doesn't just leave stories until there's new information. If the crisis is big enough for instant coverage, then they're going to look at all possible angles and fish until they have something. This is one of the reasons that today's organizational leader needs to be an effective communicator because they need to be the person that the media is going to. They need to make themselves regularly available and manage all of this in a way to minimize the speculation so that they can drive the narrative. During a crisis, leaders have the opportunity to be the agenda setting agents for the crisis because all the media outlets want to hear from them. One of the worst things that a leader can do is to simply not be available for the media. For example, the disappearance of the Malaysian Airlines flight that was bound for China has been largely viewed as a PR failure because of a perceived lack of communication from its leaders by the families of the passengers. The problem is that they did regular updates a few times a day, but as you can imagine, people are incredibly anxious about their friends and family, and the leadership wasn't as sensitive to the communication needs of their stakeholders, so that even when they came out to say there was no information available, they weren't talking about the process they were following, they weren't necessarily talking directly to the families, all of this was done via spokesperson at an official press conference. For the largely Chinese families that were affected, this seemed like the Malaysian Airlines company wasn't being forthcoming. The reality just was that there wasn't anything to report, but that didn't matter. The leaders weren't taking the opportunity to communicate directly with those who had been affected. Additionally, effective leaders are able to make an emotional connection with the stakeholders who are most directly affected by the crisis, as well as other public stakeholders more broadly. 
One of the downfalls for VP was that Tony Hayward, who was the CEO at the time, did not come across as a particularly warm or reassuring person. If you look at the text of what he said, aside from the gaffes, he actually said most of the right things. It's just that his communication style failed to provide the reassurance that external stakeholders needed. He really failed to emotionally connect with folks because he came across as an overly stuffy, cold person. Finally, in order to meet the psychological and emotional role of crisis leadership, leaders also need to be inspiring. So they need to go beyond making us feel good. They need to make us feel like we're connected to the success of the crisis that's being managed. When we're talking about inspiration, we're really focusing on charismatic leadership and people who lead their companies through challenging times. Certainly, Steve Jobs was an example of a charismatic leader, but he wasn't the only one in the technology industry who was. During the 1990s, the semiconductor manufacturing industry in the US was struggling to be competitive, and Robert Noyce created a cross-company research consortium, basically getting competitors to agree to collaborate on research to improve US-built semiconductors. It was called Semitech. What he was able to do because of his approach to leadership was to inspire competitors to collaborate and improve the products to be more globally competitive. These leaders like Noyce and like Nelson Mandela are able to be successful advocates within their organizations and also outside of them because of the same characteristics that draw people to them within their organizations also tend to make them appealing to media outlets and to other kinds of stakeholders. But we also have to remember that leaders must serve more than just an emotional role. They must also serve functional roles. Now that's not to say the same person necessarily needs to be the emotional and the functional leaders. In many cases, we'll find that people like Robert Noyce, who is excellent in serving the psychological and emotional roles of crisis leadership, may not be the best functional leaders. It may be that others focus on the material crisis. And so this is also about recognizing different aptitudes as part of modern organizational leadership as well. One of the first qualities of the functional role of leadership is that leaders need the legitimate authority to act in crisis. This is more than just being a boss. For example, President Trump has a massive amount of power conferred to him because of his office. However, the question about his legitimacy to act in a crisis is probably more of a challenge. When we're talking about power, we're talking about more than just a Machiavellian ability to force people to do things that they wouldn't ordinarily do. It can mean a lot of different things, and each can be legitimate depending on the organizational culture and circumstances. So let's take a look at the five sources of power. Any single leader doesn't necessarily have to embody all of these, but the most powerful leaders will have multiple sources of power because it makes them more appealing to different types of people. The first type of power is reward power. Who signed your bonus check and does that motivate you? The easiest way to think about reward power is as a Pavlovian response. If I'm training my dog, I offer him a reward for behaving, and so that reinforces the good behavior that I'm trying to encourage. In a crisis context, when organizations are struggling to solve a problem, sometimes they'll offer rewards for crowdsourcing solutions. It's a positive way to get people to focus on problems through incentivizing solutions. Employee reward schemes, bonuses, and even customer reward schemes are all ways of harnessing reward power. On the other side of the coin is coercive power. Now this is what we often think in terms of power, what I just called a Machiavellian view of power, where people perform because we hold some kind of power of negative consequences over them. In traditional classrooms, when I'm marking, I hold coercive power over my students. If they fail to perform to my expectations, I can give them a bad mark, which has a knock-on in terms of effects. While the good mark is nice, it's the aversion of the bad mark that probably motivates more students. So this can be an effective way to get what we want out of people, fear of negative consequences. In the case of a crisis, because crises produce fear, this can be harnessed effectively to get various stakeholders focused on finding solutions. Yet, the peculiar thing with fear is that it has to be wielded very carefully. 
because there's what we call a curvilinear relationship between fear and motivation, meaning that fear motivates us only to a certain point, that when we increase fear beyond a way that people can really cope, it serves as a demotivator, where people will either just not act or act exactly opposite of what we want. If we think about revolutions, mutinies, takeovers, a lot of times these happen because the fear stops working. Crises can be incredibly overwhelming, so coercive fear can be used, but it should be used very cautiously. Third, legitimate power is about stakeholders' perceptions that the leader has the authority and the legitimate right to prescribe behavior for them. Think about the age-old kid rebellion, you're not the boss of me. In this case, it's not whether the leader can reward or punish us, it's that we recognize and accept their authority. This comes from the belief that the person has the formal right to make demands and to expect others to be compliant and obedient. A president, prime minister, or monarch has legitimate power. So does a CEO, religious minister, or fire chief. Electoral mandates, social hierarchies, cultural norm, and organizational structure all provide the basis for legitimate power. This type of power, however, can be unpredictable and even unstable. So if we lose our position or title, our legitimate power can instantly disappear because people were influenced by the position rather than the leader. Also, the scope of power is limited to the situations that others believe you have the right to control. For example, if a fire chief tells people to stay away from a burning building, they'll likely listen. But if he or she makes two people try and act more courteously towards one another, that instruction is likely to be ignored. Fourth, referent power comes from one person liking and respecting another and identifying with him or her in some way. Celebrities can have referent power, which is why they can influence everything from what people buy to which politician they elect. In a workplace, a person with referent power often makes people feel good, so they tend to have a lot of influence. Referent power can be big responsibility because you don't necessarily have to do anything to earn it. So it can be abused quite easily. Someone who's likable but lacks integrity and honesty may rise to power and use that power to hurt and alienate people as well as gain personal advantage. Relying on referent power alone is not a great strategy for a leader who wants longevity and respect. When it's combined with expert power, however, it can help you be very successful. In crisis contexts, it can be really useful because there are people who can get a strong share of the media's coverage. Finally, expert power is probably the most controllable, or at least within our power to control, and enduring. When you have the knowledge and skills that enable you to understand a situation, suggest solutions, use solid judgment, and generally outperform others, people will listen to you, trust you, respect what you say. As a subject matter expert, your ideas have value and others look to leadership in this area. But what's more, you can build your confidence, decisiveness, and a reputation for rational thinking into other subjects and issues. This is a good way to build and maintain expert power which is all about improving leadership skills as well. So in the context of crisis, this is a source of power that can be the most compelling because people want to have faith in the knowledge and the experience of the people in charge of any particular situation. They want to feel like they actually know what they're doing. If a leader has power then, and hopefully clearly aided by an effective crisis plan, they're able to create or implement the appropriate procedures to respond to the crisis. Because of the power they have, effective leaders are able to get obedience so that when they say X, Y, or Z needs to happen, it does. But one of the challenges in a moment of crisis is that people can be easily sidetracked by the situation. So part of the functional role of leaders is also that they're able to keep people on track so that they're not focused on the uncertainty of the situation and the response strategy is properly executed. This works at the organizational level, stakeholder level, and certainly the level of a group. When we've talked about group roles, this is one of the critical roles during crisis preparation and management for the crisis team.
and especially focusing on response integrity. The functional role of leadership is an inside out role as well, because one of the critical components to functional leadership is effectively managing relationships with people. So effective crisis leaders are able to build perceptions of justice for all stakeholders. This doesn't necessarily that all stakeholders are going to get what they want because of the crisis, but the process for managing stakeholders needs to be transparent and fair, and leaders have a lot to do with creating and communicating this impression. Second, because of their leadership role, one of the most important functional tasks they have is to build long-term group relationships within the organization, but also importantly with outside groups. As we've mentioned, crises tend to bring together groups with very different interests, whether it's corporations and government agencies, nonprofits, health organizations, environmental advocacy groups, research groups like universities or consumer groups. All of these types of stakeholders may not have previously interacted together. However, a crisis can result in collaborations between any or all of them. So a critical role for a leader during a crisis is to be an effective boundary spanner so that once the connection to these stakeholders is made, when possible, they're maintained because these can often represent important partners in the future for issue management, innovation, and managing new rules and regulations. Third, along these lines in modern organizational environments, creating a participative culture within an organization and between an organization and its stakeholders is an important functional role that leaders can serve. Because stakeholders are looking to leaders, it can be a way to reaffirm or even develop two-way engagement from decision makers to interested stakeholders. But then that also leads us to the more traditional public relations roles for leaders. And one of the first questions we have to ask is whether the CEO should be the spokesperson. Conventional wisdom generally says yes, but there's a caveat. In serious crises, all stakeholders expect to hear from the boss. But that doesn't necessarily mean that he or she is going to be the only spokesperson. They have to be seen and heard from, but they have other jobs to do as well, so their presence has to be managed. But this is also moderated by the timing and severity of the crisis. But what I mean in terms of timing is that the CEO is probably not the first person from the organization that the public or media will hear from. If that's the case, then it's going to signal that it's a major crisis. So it would certainly serve to escalate perceptions of severity, and that has to be considered. In addition, there's some degree of debate about having CEOs address all crises because their words in the crisis can make it seem more important, garner more media attention and the like, but certainly if a crisis is severe, they have to be heard from. And this is something that I mentioned earlier, but during crises, leaders serve important agenda setting functions for organizations precisely because of their position. When they're effective communicators, they're able to get their message out, get additional media coverage when they need it, and to build a credible narrative about the crisis itself. Of course, all of this requires that organizations and their leaders be truthful, ethical, and stakeholder focused in their communication. But when they are, because of the important roles that leaders play, the psychological or emotional roles, functional roles, and definitely the public relations roles, they have the singular opportunity to make a difference for their organizations during crises. However, we've seen many examples with people like Travis Kalanick of Uber, Tony Hayward of BP, and probably the most obvious of all, President Trump that when leaders fail to serve these roles, and in all three of these guys' cases, they became a source of crisis for their organizations, it can genuinely damage their organizations despite anything else that might be going on.